1940. Panem in the test city, Germany. They have been waiting for this day for many years. Finally, Adolf Hitler and his closest associates hurried to the base to observe the unique advancements of German scientists. A top secret project of the Third Reich that was intended to alter the course of history. They entered the hangar and gasped. What they saw surpassed all expectations. It was the world's first combat robot, Panzer Golem, a five-meter armored colossus meant to be controlled by a human operator from within. Information about this miraculous weapon has long been stored in Soviet archives along with other top-secret military developments of the Third Reich. It's hard to believe, but this was a model of the world's first transformer. It was constructed by the brilliant German designer Werner Trommelklang. In a few years, he was to transform the dormant robot into a lethal machine. The Panzer Golem was designed to move at a speed of 50 kilometers per hour and fire from four integrated guns. It was a super weapon that Hitler planned to use to conquer the entire world. Secret projects of the Third Reich, steel robots and amphibious tanks. A remarkable invention by German scientists that assisted the Nazis in initiating a war with the USSR. The tanks moved along the bottom and the air flowed through the pipe like a periscope, for example. German UFO. Secret experiments with flying saucers designed by the Nazis. Nanique newsreel footage from the Second World War. This refers to instantaneous movement, speed, silent flight, and potentially the absence of a sound barrier. Well, the most important thing is the enormous potential for maneuverability. Airplanes generally do not have such maneuverability. The Hammer of Thor project, the world's first psychotropic weapon designed to manipulate people's will using special repeater antennas. Within a certain radius around these objects, their influence on human consciousness resulted in people beginning to fight fanatically, regardless of the circumstances, until their last drop of blood. German rockets were aimed at the Empire State Building. The tragedy of September 11th could have occurred in America half a century earlier. Death Mirror and Sound Cannon. These were top secret projects of the fascists, developed until the last days of the war, which could have altered the course of our history. nineteen thirty nine the Baltic coast of Germany Hans Stoffer peered into the narrow window and could not contain his panic something told him that he would never leave this cabin again Hans was a longtime member of the armored forces yet he'd never been in a tank today this man had the great honor of testing the top secret development of German scientists, amphibious tanks. These are the world's first armored tracked behemoths capable of maneuvering underwater. Nazi scientists sealed these tanks and outfitted them with air balloons. Incredibly, according to the scientists' plan, the tanks were supposed to cross the English Channel. It was a unique development, the first ever deep sea tank. But why was this tank necessary? In 1939, Hitler invaded a large portion of Europe, Poland, the Netherlands, Belgium and France. Now the Führer was planning a blitzkrieg on Britain. 
However, how can we cross the sea? How can we transport 160,000 soldiers and heavy equipment to the other side? It seems that the goal is unattainable. However, German scientists found a solution. They decided to traverse the strait using tanks that can operate underwater. The machines were ready for testing. The tanks roared and advanced towards the water. Those present held their breath. The outcome of the ensuing war, the fate of the Fuhrer's grand plans, hinged on this experiment. Previous models of these tanks, on which 800,000 Reichsmarks were expended, did not pass the tests. The heavy equipment immediately sank and could no longer resurface. So, scientists were confronted with a task. The tanks had to be equipped with an oxygen cylinder, which would enable the machines to descend gradually to the desired depth and resurface if necessary, by pumping air into these cylinders. And the designers managed to bring this idea to life. The tanks hit the water's surface and instantly vanished from sight. It was a victory. The first successful experiment with a superweapon. The Fuhrer's entourage was already calculating how many days it would take to swiftly conquer Britain. It would be easy with such tanks. The crews of two tanks immediately called for help. Hans looked around in fear. The car is leaking. The tank was gradually filled with water. He could not steer the tank back. Water got into the engine and the mechanism failed. In desperation, Hans hurried to the hatch. To reach the surface, one had to ascend through nine meters of water. At last, the constipation subsided. At the same moment, a ton of water fell on Stouffer's head. Such will be the consequences of this experiment. Two out of ten tanks will forever remain at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. But even with the tanks that survived, there was no reason to go to Britain. The machines required modernization. They needed to be more effectively sealed, outfitted with larger oxygen cylinders, and a comprehensive evacuation system. However, all of this needed time, which Hitler did not have. It was a failure. An ambitious plan to conquer Britain via the English Channel has failed. The sea route for Germany's conquest was blocked. Only the sky remained. But the British successfully defended their airspace. A new generation of aircraft was needed to dominate the British skies. The Germans had such devices. After the war, Soviet and American spies discovered these classified documents in a Berlin office. They moved these materials to the archive and reclassified them, as the information was overly shocking. The information suggests that Nazi scientists had been working on the development of disc-shaped aircraft for several years. It's unbelievable, but what was thought to be a UFO was actually man-made. Germany is a leading country in the field of physics and in engineering in general. This is an unusual fusion, reflected in the name of what they started to create. They began to develop certain gadgets, which they referred to as technomagical devices. 1940, a secret airfield near Berlin. Hitler looked in awe at the incredible disc-shaped device that was gradually ascending from the ground. It was incredible. The airplane had no wings and its body was made of solid metal. Nevertheless, 
the car drove off. Indeed, the airplane was flawed. It swayed from side to side. It didn't maintain its balance well, but it functioned. It was a new revolutionary project. The round shape of the machine allowed it to minimize air resistance, enabling the disc to reach an incredible speed of several thousand kilometers per hour. Fast and invisible, these machines could be used for both reconnaissance and combat. When equipped with special weapons, these discs could become unparalleled fighters. In this instance, the benefits are clear. They include instantaneous travel, speed, silent flight, and potentially no sound barrier. Indeed, the most significant aspect is the immense potential for maneuverability. Generally, airplanes do not possess such agility. The engine for the first disc was constructed by the brilliant German engineer, Victor Schauberger. And this invention was revolutionary as it operated on regular water and air Mini tornadoes formed inside the chamber, which provided the machine with tremendous energy. Returning once again to a figure like Victor Schauberger, he invented an engine based on the tornado effect. Remember this phrase. I believe that soon this phrase will not be associated with flying saucers, but will form the foundation of new technologies. In other words, it is a colossal force that currently possesses limitless potential. I believe this was the secret of the Third Reich's flying saucers, the flying discs of the Third Reich. In other words, they were able to achieve such an effect. Others were unable to achieve such an effect. However, like amphibious tanks, these machines required enhancements. The designers encountered multiple challenges simultaneously. They had to ensure the device could maintain balance in the air and reduce the strain on the pilot, who otherwise could not cope with the intense pressure during flights. Scientists will need two more years to solve this problem. The first aircraft, the Vril Jaeger, did not take off until 1942. Along with the latest developments, Hanabu, Focke Wolf Discs, Zimmerman's Flying Pancake, and V7. However, all these attempts were also unsuccessful. The car didn't respond to the steering, crashed and exploded. And only in 1945, German designers finally created a perfect model of the device called the Bronze Disc. However, this scientific development will arrive too late and will no longer be able to realize the Fuhrer's grand plans. At the end of the war, the disc will simply be destroyed to prevent it from falling into the hands of the enemies who were already approaching Berlin. But even then, in 1940, great expectations were placed on the new weapon. Every year, the German government allocated at least 5 million Reichsmarks for the development of a flying saucer. This amount of money could be used to produce several thousand tanks. And yet, flying discs were recognized as a priority project. I believe they concurrently developed several models of these flying machines. As described by witnesses who observed them, some of these airplanes would ascend and travel a short distance. Although they were huge, 70 meters in diameter. After the failure of the 1940 campaign, Hitler made no further attempts to conquer Britain. However, the Fuhrer did not give up his plans, he simply adapted them. 1941, the Western Front. On that day, the Soviet soldiers could not even fathom the horror they would have to confront. While patrolling the area, they heard strange sounds coming from the direction of the river. 
As the fighters drew nearer, their eyes beheld an astonishing spectacle. Odd protrusions surfaced on the water. Terrified police officers opened fire, but the bullets ricocheted off the armored panels like pebbles. And then the water parted, and iron tanks slowly and silently emerged from the river. This is how Heinz Guderian, a witness to those events, describes a covert operation to attack the USSR in his book, Memoirs of a Soldier. Now, rivers and lakes were no longer daunting for the German army, as the Wehrmacht troops' arsenal had been enhanced with superior weapons and improved amphibious tanks. Their main advantage was not combat strength, but the element of surprise. The country was at war. Victory in any war is achieved through advantages. A military advantage is a technical advantage, meaning the possession of equipment types that the opposing side does not have. Thus, the Germans advanced, for instance, in the field of tank manufacturing. But why, in this case, didn't these tanks fulfill their primary task? Why did the Nazi regime direct them to the USSR and not to Britain? German scientists long debated the feasibility of crossing the English Channel with tanks, but experiments proved it to be impossible. The maximum depth at which the tank could safely operate should not exceed five meters. Attempts to equip cars with large oxygen cylinders have failed. The tanks were simply brought to the surface. Crossing the English Channel was impossible under such circumstances. All that amphibious vehicles could do was cross shallow rivers. Essentially, it's quite simple. The pipe is positioned over the water. This happened during the war. The tank remained underwater for as long as necessary. The technology involved exposing a pipe with tanks moving along the bottom and air being delivered through the pipe. Like a periscope, for example. And Hitler decided to utilize this invention. He first used floating tanks to attack the USSR, aimed to defeat the communists, and then planned to strike Britain. England's hope lies in Russia. If Russia is defeated, England will lose its last opportunity. Conclusion, we need to dissolve the USSR. Date, spring 1941. General Franz Halder, one of the co-authors of the operation to invade the Soviet Union, the Barbarossa Plan, wrote this in his diary. Hitler aimed to conquer the USSR within just five months and then ultimately redirect all forces to the final stronghold, Britain. However, amphibious tanks, which initially showed great promise in the USSR, ultimately did not meet expectations. To cross the river, the soldiers continually had to look for the required five-meter depth. Under different circumstances, the tanks simply remained at the bottom. In the future, German scientists will enhance this invention, creating a specialized pontoon that will enable the tank to float. This pontoon will be attached to the tank like a life buoy on a swimmer, and it will keep the vehicle afloat. Here is a rare photo of this device. It depicts a tank floating on a river like a catamaran. However, this effort also proved to be ineffective. During the battle, all the Soviet soldiers had to do was target the pontoon, and the armored behemoth would instantly submerge. But even when the cars managed to cross the river, the problems did not lessen. In conventional warfare, these tanks were inferior to their terrestrial counterparts. The vehicles had thinner armor and were more suited to intimidate the enemy than to engage in open combat. The project was forwarded to the top designers in Germany for review. People who have already developed advanced weapons to replace the cumbersome amphibious tanks.
1942, SS Research Base. They dropped the tarp and unlocked the small bolt of the cannon. With meticulous and unhurried movements, the scientists inserted the tube into the small hole, which gradually began to fill with methane. The final preparations have been completed. Footsteps were heard on the stairs. They descended deeper and deeper into the dark bunker. The concentration camp prisoners were unaware. Adolf Hitler himself was waiting for them below. The Führer decided to personally oversee the progress of the experiment proposed by German scientists. Hitler had great expectations for this experiment. The lights came on and people were startled. In front of them stood a bizarre apparatus made of slender tubes and massive speakers. What is this? However, the prisoners were not given time to think. They started to line up like soldiers. Some people were closer, and some were further away from the device. They were instructed not to move, a countdown ensued, and then a dreadful ripping noise echoed throughout the hangar. It was the first weapon in the world that killed not with lead, but with a physical phenomenon, sound. A blend of methane and oxygen was introduced into a specific compartment of such a device. Once ignited, this mixture detonated, triggering a series of subsequent explosions. These sounds were broadcasted through amplifiers. The effect was incredible. During the device's launch, it was found that the pressure on the ears was akin to being nine meters underwater. Everyone who was within a hundred meters of the device died. Those who were further away were severely mutilated. And all this was accomplished by an enhanced device invented by the Germans at the start of the 20th century. There was a physicist named Robert Wood, and one day his friend, a theater director, came to him with a request. He was planning to stage a fantastical story, and he wanted the hall to be functional too. Then Robert Wood took the thickest argon tube, connected it to a generator, and obtained frequencies below 7 hertz, and then something dreadful started to happen. You didn't hear a sound but people were crawling on the floor in fear. They were driven mad by fear. And so forth. This was accomplished at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. This improved device operated based on this principle. The sonic cannon proved to be exactly what was required. It could assist the Nazis in their skirmishes against the Red Army. However, there was one significant downside. The device was excessively bulky. Scientists understood that it would be difficult to transport and install the cannon. However, if the leader approves the project, this shortcoming can be corrected. And Hitler gave his approval and even time to carry out the plan. This time, the leader decided to take his time, as such haste had already cost him millions of Reichsmarks. Minokifuse Kurt Besch, the Peenemünde test site, Germany. The prisoners looked around in fear, an empty square extended before them. The confused prisoners were left alone. Suddenly, a peculiar noise echoed from behind them, as if a mechanical device had sprung into action. People looked around and calmed down. A metal beast emerged from the back. It was a covert Panzer Golem project that scientists had been refining for several years. The previous model was immobile, so the new robot was equipped with weapons and hydraulics. It worked. They managed to repair the transformer. It was operated by a pilot who sat inside the robot. The project promised to be revolutionary, but how did it perform in combat? This is what they wanted to check. 
the terrified prisoners fled. Gunshots echoed behind them. It was the robot that aimed the built-in machine guns at them. The prisoners ran for their lives. There appeared to be no escape. However, the robot took a step and suddenly seemed to lose its balance. In a few seconds, the massive machine wobbled and fell. That day, none of the test subjects survived on the training ground. The Nazis left no survivors. They did not regret the Panzer Golem either. The robot was demolished. The costly project did not prove its worth. 20 million Reichsmarks were spent on it, a tremendous amount of money. However, the car turned out to be a hunk of junk. There simply wasn't enough time to complete the device. War is not the most effective method, particularly in places like Germany, where resources are scarce, tensions are high, and so forth. It's not the optimal approach for developing modern or advanced types of equipment. There was certain potential, but the Germans ran out of time. But where was the Führer? The Führer, as always, was persistent in his ways. The Führer demanded the immediate creation of weapons. However, the Panzer Golem will play a significant role in the further development of top-secret weapons. It was the Panzer Golem that led the Nazis to an astounding concept. If a person can control a robot, then they would be capable of controlling a rocket. This discovery could facilitate another audacious project of the Third Reich. A project that will threaten the existence of America. February 14, 1945. German Baltic coast. There were no foreigners at the secret base. Only civil servants, the military, and the Fuhrer himself. Indeed, today, under the conditions of heightened confidentiality, a true sensation is set to occur here. The launch of a missile targeting America. It was the V-2, the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile. Nazi scientists have long been seeking ways to conquer the ocean. And finally, they found it. They constructed a two-stage rocket capable of flying four and a half thousand kilometers. The rocket weighed 100 tons and was intended to deliver 350 kilograms of explosives to New York in 35 minutes of flight. That is, of course, it was about developing a fundamentally new type of aviation technology that could be utilized for military objectives. The bombing not only affected London, but also the United States of America. It was a revolutionary advancement by rocket engineer Werner von Braun, a scientist who would later catalyze the development of the global space industry. Werner von Braun was the foremost. He was there even before Korolev. It's no secret that America's venture into space was also credited to Werner von Braun, who later worked for the Americans. And it was the development by this scientist that was supposed to target the USA. Pfau had to clearly hit the target, the Empire State Building, which was the largest skyscraper of that time and the pride of America. But how do I do it? After all, Pfau did not have a navigation system. This issue was resolved by equipping a special cabin in the missile body, similar to the Panzer Golem. The pilot had to control the flight from this cockpit, and then he died. He had no opportunity to save himself. Finally, everything was prepared. The command was given. The people present froze in tension. Just a little while longer, and America will be explored. For the first time, the United States will be struck at its core. 
V-2, the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile, was ready for launch. The pilot in the cockpit prepared himself. The command was given. The audience was held in suspense. It wouldn't be long before America would be discovered. For the first time, the United States will be struck at its core. They will target the Empire State Building, that is, the largest skyscraper of that era, the pride of America. Suddenly, strange sounds emanated from the speakers. These were warning signs. Something went wrong. A few seconds passed, and the missile plunged into the Atlantic. It turned out that the pilot who was inside could not endure the extreme stress from the flight speed and, to spare himself from suffering, bit into a cyanide capsule. So the unguided rocket fell into the ocean. The project was destined to fail, just like Germany's fate itself. American aviation continued to relentlessly destroy the most crucial military targets of the Third Reich. Soviet troops had already entered the country, and as time for salvation dwindled, the projects of German scientists became increasingly desperate. In the winter of 1945, the residents of the half-destroyed Germany were required to surrender all their household mirrors to the government. So the project was planned to be implemented under the code name Solar Cannon. Engineers were tasked with constructing a gigantic convex mirror from the gathered materials, which could be positioned in space. The mirror was designed to concentrate sunlight and direct it towards Earth, creating a stream of lethal plasma that would obliterate everything in its path, destroying ships, incinerating entire cities, vaporizing rivers, and melting machinery. But this project was never realized. As modern researchers have concluded, the concept of the solar cannon was sheer madness from the very beginning. Speak with any physicist about the size a mirror would need to be to achieve that kind of focusing. Take a magnifying glass and focus it on the wood on a sunny day. Everyone did this as a child. The wood begins to smolder. However, considering the size of the magnifying glass and the focal length, you'll realize how impossible it is to achieve this from space. However, the scientists managed to harness one of the elements and even learned how to induce tornadoes using the new device. Gas was supplied to this device and ignited. At the pipe's outlet, the gas spiraled into a tempest, then combined with coal dust and transformed into a tornado. The tornado was expected to reach speeds of 150 kilometers per hour, potentially capable of bringing down aircrafts in flight. The experiments were successful, but the charge that triggered the tornado was only 300 meters high. Enemy aircraft at this distance remained unreachable. All this weapon was capable of was shooting down low-flying assault aircraft. And then it was not the designers, but the zoologists who proposed the solution. Instead of a cannon, they proposed a design for a new aircraft that was intended to fully mimic the flight of a hummingbird, flying vertically and horizontally. To accomplish this, the plan was to position wings with jet engines around the hull. During takeoff, they were designed to revolve around the fuselage to ensure vertical liftoff. Once airborne, the plane could execute a horizontal roll and assume a combat stance. However, the project took too much time to implement, and the Germans had to abandon this idea. The last insane experiment of the Nazis was a project named Thor's Hammer. 
The author was a German professor named Mohr, who worked on creating a machine capable of influencing human behavior. It was the first attempt in history to create a psychotropic weapon. The device was intended to zombify millions of people. It seems unbelievable, but contemporary researchers have discovered that such a weapon is indeed feasible. From the documents of the Third Reich, we understand that these fields, generated by specific devices, were primarily intended to influence certain formations in the pituitary gland. These areas of the brain were referred to as crystals of will by the Germans, in accordance with their terminology. And here's an oddity. In the early 1980s, a publication appeared in one of the academic journals where Georgi Bogdanov, a colonel and PhD, wrote about this exact topic, stating that there exist natural solid-state semiconductor systems in the pituitary gland. By influencing these systems, you can not only evoke a visual image or some kind of representation in a person, but also prompt a person to alter their behavioral responses. For this reason, in 1945, about 18 such facilities, camouflaged as regular cottages, were scattered across Germany. Using repeater antennas, they transmitted belief in victory to the residents. And it worked. As the Allied forces observed, there was a direct correlation between the presence of antennas in the area and the intensity of the defense. The city of Ruhr was only occupied after the aircraft destroyed some peculiar antennas located in the forest. The same was true in the town of Altstadt, and in western Bohemia, where Thor's hammer was kept for the longest time, German resistance continued even after the surrender of the Reich. Reports indicate that about 12 unusual objects, resembling ruins, were actually discovered in Germany. These objects, whether by accident or design, were fiercely defended. Maybe they held significant importance, hence the Germans' passionate defense. Or, despite their impending defeat, the Germans fought with the desperation of the doomed. Perhaps. There's also a theory suggesting the Third Reich already possessed psychotronic weapons. Indeed, this version affirms that the theory of a specific radius around these objects holds true. In other words, the impact on human consciousness resulted in people truly starting to fight fanatically, regardless of the circumstances, until their last drop of blood. It was Hitler's last trump card in battle, a trump card that couldn't alter anything. The Panzer Golem battle robot, flying discs, death mirror, and Thor's hammer, all these projects were real. They all worked. The only thing the Nazis lacked was time to perfect their projects. Time, which became a decisive factor in the history of the Third Reich.